Welcome back to We Love This Book. Today we are here with Phil Earl, who is the author of Demolition Dad. So we're going to chat a little bit about the book. Tell me a bit about Demolition Dad, where the idea came from. So, um, the idea to write younger came from uh, this, this thing of uh, having spent the last four years writing thoroughly miserable books for young adults. It's, I found it really interesting how um, the industry we work in sometimes we pigeonhole writers. And you know, people will say, well, you know, David Almond does this and Marcus Sedgwick does this. It's not true, every writer has, is, is versatile. And because my kids were reaching the kind of, well, my eldest son is, is nine, and so I wanted to write something that he could, he could read without being thoroughly depressed. Every night we read together and we were reading Danny Champion in the World, which I hadn't read since I was a kid. It just really profoundly moved both of us. Uh, and it stayed with us, both of us. We talked about it a lot for a long time after. And, and I realised it was that father and son relationship. There was something really special about reading it to Albie. And so I, I started chewing this idea on how could I rewrite Danny Champion? Okay. How could I pay homage? And so obviously I couldn't make that a poacher because that's already been done. And so I thought, okay, what secret could Dad have? And I came up with wrestling because wrestling wrestling wasn't even a guilty pleasure for me as okay. a kid. Re wrestling was a joy. Okay. And I used to love it. And I used to fill endless VHS tapes really? with, with WWE wrestling. <laughs> And my dad used to come in and say, Phil, for the love of God, you are wasting your life. Nothing good will ever come of you watching this tat. Because actually wrestling gives us something really nice to hang off. It's a big world. It's bigger, you know, it's dramatic and stupid and funny and ridiculous. And it's a really nice vehicle. Because like, when I was growing up, wrestlers, like American wrestlers were, you know, they were pumped, full of steroids, and they were muscly, and they had amazing personas like Hulk Hogan or the Ultimate Warrior. And, and, and we in Britain had Big Daddy. Yeah who was 25 stern, 65 years old, and his real name was Shirley Crabtree. Do you know what I mean? We worry though about, like, with wrestling being inherently a violent pursuit. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, because in America, America, they don't call wrestling a sport now, they call it sports entertainment, because, okay. it, because it's fixed, you yeah. know, which is devastating. I mean, the book, the book you know, ha has wrestling as a, as, a, as a premise, but it's not what the book is about. It's cartoonish, it's almost like watching um, you know, two Warner Brothers cartoon characters n knocking living daylights out of each other. And um, it just allowed me to really play with it. You know, I wondered whether editors would think, oh no, Phil just writes miserable stuff, he can't do the young thing. But actually, the first thing I ever wrote when I started writing was middle grade. So it was okay, kind, of nice okay. to, kind of nice to go back to it. And has your son read it? He has. The poor little devil has had... Well, he got the first draft. Okay. I, I tried to read it in chunks as well, like, so like kind of market research as I was writing it. Uh, I've met a few authors who've written stuff for their kids and have written a chapter every day and I just haven't had time to do it that. The poor lad has had, has had various drafts inflicted on him. Okay. Um, but he's proud of it, I yeah, think. Of course, yeah. It started with him. Yeah. The other really nice reason for writing it is, is the book is a complete and utter love letter to my dad. Okay. You know, my dad's awesome and right. you know, he's very northern. He doesn't express his emotion freely. It's a really nice thing to be able to turn around and say, you know, hey, oh, Dad, this is, this is Vienna Books dedicated to him. I hope I might get a tear out of him. If I get a tear okay. out of him, it's going to be joy. Okay. You've got some quite, like, dark moments, and how do you kind of approach making sure that the tone yeah. is right for that? The book is in part about depression, and that was a very conscious thing. I had problems myself in my 20s. My head fell apart in dramatic fashion working in the kids' homes. I just took on too much too young. Right. And so I wanted to write about things that I understood a little bit about. Um, but I wanted to do it with a really light, deft touch. Uh, and then people like Morris Gleitzman. Mm -hmm. You know, when you read things like Two Weeks with the Queen, it's a romp and it's funny, but it's also got this huge heart. And so Gleitzman and Jackie Wilson were really the two kind of beacons that I okay. held up. You've just been told an amazing story. And if you learn something along the way, all well and good. Yeah. But it's not an issue, really. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of things you know about, your day job is obviously working yeah. in children's books as well. Do you keep? Do you have to just like do you have separate headspaces for them, or how do you kind of? It's really deal hard. With that? I find it really difficult, increasingly difficult, in the and especially working in sales, being a cynical sales monkey. It's very difficult <laughs> not to judge everything by how well I'm selling. Ninety-five percent of why it doesn't go up with a certain situation. And I certainly didn't have anything cynical in my head about like you know I've done why now. I need to do something different. Okay. It was just, this was, I'd run out of ideas for why. Right. Uh, or certainly ideas that were burning to come out. Okay. I go into schools a lot. I do a lot of schools events. And I talk a lot about being surrounded by stories and, and the fact that behind every front door on the street where you live, there's at least one story waiting for okay. you to tell. And in the 80s, I just, I didn't read a lot. I was a terrible reader as a kid. 
But I used to go to the theatre a lot, Holt Hook okay. Theatre. And John Godber, this writer from, from Yorkshire, he started writing plays about normal people who were like bouncers and teachers and hairdressers and rugby players. And it was absolutely revelatory. You know, there's amazing drama in our everyday life. Did you always kind of visualise it as an illustrated book? And I just think Sarah's a genius. She has that amazing, quite rare ability to do humour and heart at the same time, sometimes yeah. in the same spread. We don't want to prescribe to, to Sarah what she illustrates. Right. Because it turns out Sarah was a huge wrestling fan. Really? Which was brilliant. She grew up watching wrestling on a Saturday afternoon in World of Sport with her mum. And I saw it the grand, I think, too. And so we, we just said to her, well, choose what you want to illustrate. Oh, cool. Okay. Because I really like this idea of collaboration. You know, it's like, you know, when, when Sarah McIntyre talks about her work with Philip Reeve, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a collaboration. And I really strongly believe that, you know, she, Sarah has brought so much life to this book that wasn't in there. What are you, are you working on next? Are you going to stay in yeah. grade? Yeah, we're staying on Story Street, so okay. there are four books to come, okay. like, in total, four books uh, all set on Story Street, and I hope there'll be more. Uh, in the, in the motion Dad, uh, Jake's best mate is Mouse, yeah. and Mouse is superhero obsessed, and he even until quite you know he starts he even wears his cape under his school uniform okay. and tucks it into his pants, okay. uh, and he just he's desperate to be a superhero, okay. but he has absolutely no powers whatsoever, obviously. Um, so the second book is about Mouse, and what I love, and this comes from reading Nick Hornby and comes from reading George Pelicanos, which is a million miles away from this. But they often like lace their novels with incidental characters that then one book on will become the main character. Yeah. You know, and I love that. That's really it. Dave, well, David Mitchell does that. I've uh, never read any Dave. Okay. Well, maybe you'd like he's, it. He's too clever for me. Oh, I don't do words no, that are that big. No, but it's not. That's why. Because like, I'm not a fan of books that are kind of, you know, wordy and wordy for their own sake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he does the same thing. Yeah, there's characters in all, like, lots of characters that come and crop up in lots of That's great, because it's like an Easter egg. It's like, you know, the DVD Easter yeah. egg. Basically, uh, Mouse has a mum who is awesome, who's a lollipop lady. Okay. And one day, completely inadvertently, she foils uh, a jewellery robbery. Okay. And everyone lords her as this new breed of superhero. Okay. And Mouse just goes, this is awesome, because yeah. now I get to be the sidekick. Okay. And what happens after that is a bit ridiculous. And there are lots of very rubbish wannabe superheroes. So okay. it's kind of kick ass for kids. Yeah. This is, and the next one is for me mum. It's me. It's okay. my, you know, it's my bit of okay. But, you know, this one's for me dad and the next one's for me mum. Okay. And my, my youngest son, Stanley, who's named after Fat Stanley and Stanley Elmax, okay. of course. He's, he's four and he's never without his cape or his, his Batman helmet. Okay. So it's kind of for him. Okay. He's been good inspiration. Oh, thank you so much for chatting to us about Demolition Dad, which is out. May 7th, Excellent. general election. Don't bother voting. <laughs> we don't understand. Thank you very much. But vote as well. Thank you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs>